Thank you for joining us here at First Baptist Church of San Antonio, whether online or on broadcast, in your homes or wherever you may be. We want you to know that you are more than welcome to be a part of the life of this church, and we want you to know that we want you to meet Jesus today. In order for this to happen regularly, we need your support, we need your prayers, and we need your financial gifts. Please continue to give and be a part of what we do today. Wow. Now with the same passion and joy, will you read scripture with me? John chapter 19, verses 31 through 37. Please stand and let's read the word of God together. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of his shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Let's pray. Father, we love your word. We're grateful for John's testimony to us, written by the very power of your spirit. Help us to see, hear, and understand, and to live according to the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Now, I have a little work for you this morning. If you've already looked at your listening guide, you've noticed I've left some blanks for you to fill out. I won't leave you hanging. I'll let you know what you need to fill out, or it'll be very obvious, um, but I want us all to engage in what John is trying to convey to us uh, through this snapshot of what was happening at the foot of the cross. This is week three at the foot of the cross. We have heard the most powerful words, the most powerful phrase, the dividing line in human history in verse 30 when he says, it is finished. And now we find ourselves here again where Jesus has already passed and John is putting together these final moments with Jesus on the cross. If you've spent much time in John, and you certainly see it here in these texts, John has a particular purpose when he wrote the gospel. John's purpose for us is to believe in Jesus. There's your first fill in the blank, folks, just letting you know. That's the first one. John's purpose is for us to believe in Jesus. Now, John is very helpful. He's a very helpful guide in his gospel. If you go to John chapter 20, he sums it all up in verse 31. He says, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. His purpose is that we might believe. Now, I'm just going to walk through a few texts throughout the Gospel of John in case you're in any doubt as to John's purpose. Uh, John 1 verse 7, talking to John the Baptist, he says, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. John 1 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. John 2 11, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already 
because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 4, 39, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. John 4, 41, many more believed because of his word. John 4, 42, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. John, getting tired yet? John 14, 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. John 16, 30, now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. John 17, 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, talking about us, but for those who believe in me through their word, John 17, 21, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. It's John's purpose in delivering this gospel to us years after the others had been written, perhaps decades. His desire is for new generations of believers in his day and in ours that we believe in Jesus, whom he saw with his own eyes. Now, if you're still hesitant about the purpose of John, let me just demonstrate via graphic. I did the research this week. So in comparison to all the other gospels, this is how many times John says the word believe. He has an agenda. He has an agenda. And so the question for us here is in this text, in verses 31 through 37, what would John have us believe? He says in 1935, right? In 1935, he says, and who, he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. What does he want us to believe in verses 31 through 37? What is he trying to convey to us? What, do want, what does he want us to hold on to? Now, let me just say, there is a lot to see here in these texts, and I'm not, to get, I'm not gonna get everywhere. We're not gonna look at everything. It's not lost on me, the irony that the Jewish leaders were rushing to take down the body of Jesus in order to obey the law and in, also in preparation of the Passover on Sabbath day. It's not lost to me that they were, had actually been preparing the, the Lamb of God the whole time. John wants us to see those and make those connections among others. There's a lot to see, but there is one thing in particular, at least one thing that I want to draw to our attention that John really wants us to see. In verse 34, he says, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And this is after they determined that Jesus was already dead and there was no reason to break his bones. It's as if John is saying, just to be certain, just to make sure you understand, I want you to believe that Jesus is really dead. John wants us to believe his testimony, his eyewitness account that Jesus really died on the cross. That's the picture of blood and water flowed. If there is any doubt to the reality of the death of Jesus, it's right there. I mean, he didn't faint after all. They knew he was dead, but if, if you want to be certain, they also pierced his side. My Jesus died on the cross. And there's probably a lot of symbolism there, water and blood. The reality is we don't know all that John might have been pointing to when he described it that way. We know it was a medical reality, but what we can say for certain is that John wants us to know Jesus died on the cross. That's where he died. He confirms this just the next chapter over when he retells for us Thomas's story. Now, Thomas probably didn't doubt that Jesus died. But in that recounting, retelling of that story of Thomas's doubt to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, John captures for us the holes in Jesus' hand and the piercing in his side when Jesus invites Thomas, put your hand here, put your fingers here. This is, this is John taking another opportunity 
to say, can I just tell you again that you need to believe that Jesus really died on the cross? Uh, Not just that he rose again. If he rose again, he had to have died, and he died not just in any old way. He died on the cross. He confirms that need for us to believe in the death of Jesus through the retelling of Thomas's story, and Thomas needed to believe. Thomas needed to believe that Jesus really died and really rose again. But what is it about Jesus' death by crucifixion that is so important for us to believe? Now granted, all that I'm about to share you is not packed in to verses 31 through 37, but we can take account to the fuller scriptures to make sense of that question. Why is Jesus' death by crucifixion so important for us to believe? Now, John does capture us for us the first reason. And the first reason, he has said over and over and over again, Jesus' death on the cross was to fulfill God's plan. Right? He's all along the way, he has said, by the way, this is a fulfillment in the Scripture. By the way, he said this because this is what God has planned all along. It is essential that we believe that Jesus died on the cross because that was part of God's plan. We go back to verse 30 where Jesus says, it is finished. That's what, that's what these, this verse means, that his death and everything leading up to the crucifixion was a part of the redemptive work of God from long ago. And John wants us to know that. Don't lose sight of that. In in verse 36, he says, These things happened in fulfillment of the Scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken. Another Passover messianic reference. The lamb, the lamb during Passover meal, not a bone could be broken. And Jesus fulfilled that requirement. And in verse 37, and again other scriptures say, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. This is Zechariah 12.10 and Psalm 22. You can see it all over the scriptures. John says, I want you to know that, that Jesus really died on the cross and it was in order to fulfill the plan of God. The second reason that we need to believe that Jesus died on that cross is that the curse of our sin When I say our, I mean all of humanity's past, present, and future sin for those who would believe. The curse of our sin was fully manifested in the body of Jesus when he died on the cross. Now this is very important for us to believe and hold on to when we consider that Jesus really died on the cross. Jesus didn't just die any old death, did he? It's not enough that Jesus just grew old and died in our in his humanity, and then rose again three days later. It's not enough that Jesus might have had an accident somewhere along the way in life and then rose again victorious over that accident and his broken humanity. No, it was required that Jesus would be our curse for our sin on that tree. And the fullness of our sin would be manifested in the body of Jesus. The beatings, the shame, the scourging, the crown of thorns, the carrying of the cross, the piercing of the hands and the feet, and the the spear in his side, all of it portrayed the horrific, brutal reality, ugliness of our sin, and it's deserving of the full wrath of God. Where do we go to find that truth in the Scriptures we were just in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself bore our sins, where? In his body on the cross. John wants us to believe that when Jesus died, he died on the worst, most horrific execution possible in the known world which belonged to us. And he took it in his body. And not only, when we look at the cross and everything that led up to the cross, we see the complete horrific depravity of man and woman. The third thing that we need to believe and the reality that Jesus died on the cross is that If there was no death, there's no victory. 
Now that's obvious. There's no death, there's no victory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, perhaps, well not perhaps, no hedging here. It is the most extensive teaching of Paul about the nature of the resurrection of the church anywhere in Scripture. It's incredible. But the Corinthians had come to a place somehow, mostly because of influence of Greek philosophy, was that although Jesus really rose from the grave, the church isn't going to rise bodily from the grave. I mean, we already have the Holy Spirit. That's what they were thinking. We already have the Spirit of God. Why? It can't get any better than this. We've realized everything that it means to be the children of God. There's no need for a bodily resurrection. So Paul has to correct them on that. And he says, listen, don't you know if, if, if the dead in Christ don't rise, then Jesus didn't even rise from the grave. And if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then you're left in your sins. You have no forgiveness of sin. But there is a beautiful assumption, historical assumption that Paul makes when he makes this argument. Um, in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let me just paraphrase. Uh, Paul says, if Christ has not risen from the grave, then no one has risen from, risen from the grave, right? And that's a part of his argument, verses 13 through 17, but the assumption is, is that Jesus was where? In the grave. That Jesus died. He died on the cross and three days later he rose again. If somehow Jesus was just fainted on the cross because of the immense pain and suffering and somehow they whisked him away before he actually died and recovered, then his resurrection's a sham. It's a con. It's a cover up. John wants us to know, you, you need to know that, that we declare Jesus the risen one from the grave, and I saw him die with my very eyes. You can imagine that new believer or that person in the marketplace where they're trying to convince them of the gospel truth. And the apostle here is writing to those churches and those churches and those people who are speaking in the marketplace, you tell them, I saw him die with my own eyes. He didn't faint. He didn't fall asleep because it was so hard or whatever. He, he, he died on the cross because it is a requirement for him to have victory over death and sin that he die and then rise again three days later. Of course, you know all this. You know these things. I'm not telling you thing, anything new. Uh, you could rattle this stuff off if you had spent some time in the text to think about it. I mean, I had all week to think about how I was going to share these things with you. If you had the same amount of time, you would have come up with a similar list, especially if you grew up in church hearing these scriptures. But the reality is we can take all of this for granted for us, the death on the cross and the resurrection can be a romantic notion, ideologies that we've just held on to and val valiant and noble beliefs. Yes, we believe them, but we can take them for granted. Thomas didn't take them for granted. Thomas didn't take it for granted. It was absolutely essential. It was not a, a noble, romantic thought to himself. He, he had heard, he had seen crucifixions in the past. He knew exactly how brutal and horrific they were. He had heard testimony from the other apostles that they saw him, his side get pierced and blood and water flow. Uh, for, for Thomas, the brutality of the cross loomed large and then the, the story of Jesus rising again. This was, this was not something that Thomas could take for granted. He had to know did my, did my Jesus, my friend, my rabbi, who I believe to be the Messiah, did he really die? Did he really rise again? Now, I know Thomas didn't probably crunch all the theological numbers like we just did. It's not what was on his mind. But Thomas needed to know that this was the real deal. That it wasn't a sham or con. In our culture and society, we're not 
It's pretty common for us to see cons and shams. Let me just give you two of them. FTX is a crypto exchange company, although I don't think the founder intended for it to become a sham. It ended to be one. People had invested billions and billions and billions in this crypto exchange company. And within a week, it was gone. They invested their lives. Theranos, y'all remember Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, founder, promised to develop this new medical technology that could analyze blood in a matter of minutes. It was a sham. But she had persuaded people to give their life savings away, to invest their money, millions and hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in this con and sham of a company. All of us invest our lives in various things. These people invested their life in a con and a sham. Thomas needed to know what he was about to invest in his life and was not a sham. It was the real deal. And John captures for us, gosh, we're going to be here in just a few weeks, but John captures for us Thomas's response when he finally saw Jesus face to face and could get up close and personal to the, the holes in Jesus' hand and hole in his side. What does he declare in 20 verse 28? My Lord, my God. You are the real deal. Perhaps the clearest and most profound declaration of Jesus' is, Jesus is divinity by doubting Thomas. And Thomas would go on to leverage his whole life, invest his whole life, his life savings and everything in the reality of who Jesus is. Gave his life away for Jesus. There's nothing casual about Thomas' declaration and belief and allegiance to Jesus. That kind of truth, that kind of belief in who Jesus did, that he died and rose again from the grave, dug deep roots into his life. It rearranged his alliances to lesser kingdoms. It infused his life with lasting and eternal purpose. And so the lingering question for us is do you believe in that kind of way? Do you believe in that kind of deep, root, digging, truth kind of way that has rearranged your life? That moves you to say, I'm all in. Every bit of it. Wipe my bank account out. It's yours. My life is yours. We know Thomas ended up in India, martyred. Do you believe? That's the question John's asking us. Will you believe my testimony? And do you have the kind of belief that will change your life? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful again for your word. We need it. And so now we ask for your Holy Spirit to do the, own, the work that only he can do. To do the kind of truth, deep digging and rearranging in our life that's required. But Lord, help us all to believe. To grow in belief in such a way that it changes the very core of who we are and what we say, and what we do, and how we love, and how we work. Only you can do that. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.